I'm just going to play you a six minute piece of video from the uh, Synod press conference yesterday because it touched on something really important and I thought I would give feedback because they do ask for feedback and hopefully somebody in the church will listen to the feedback. Thank you very much. Andrew Munster, my Netherlands Dagblad, Dutch daily newspaper. <clears throat> Question for Father Timothy and for Sister Nathalie, if it's possible. Um, so we understood now that, first of all, the question of the female diaconate has been moved from the synod table to a study group, and now it's moved from there again to we don't know where. It is, is it now completely out of the synodal process? Is that what's happening? This is my first question. And then a more personal question. I have, um, I have two daughters. They are 21 and 18 years old. Um, they're French, so they're not Dutch, no danger there. Um, um, I know all the theology behind the, the, the exclusion of women of the priesthood, diaconate, etc. Ordinatius um, Vaterucialis, I know Hans Grusson But I'm not able to explain it anymore. Um, for them, this exclusion is standing between, this exclusion by the church is standing between Christ and them. What should I tell them? Can you give me some advice as a spiritual uh, leader that you are? Um, they feel like if the church is treating them as second-class citizens, because the highest positions will always be in, be in between the hands of men. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I do think often that we solve these problems by what we say, but about how we live. And I think it a lot depends upon what you think are the highest positions. Among the highest positions in the church are the doctors of the church, those who teach us. And many of them are women. Um, beginning with Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, of course. Among the greatest teachers in our church are women. And what we are, are trying to transmit is a teaching. So I think it's a very clericalist point of view to think that what really matters is who is the priest. I didn't grow up with that point of view, and I think that's a relatively modern one. So I think you have to live uh, with your daughters. They're very lucky, I'm sure, to have a Dutch father. To live with them as people who see what is fundamental of the teachings and the sacraments. That's what grounds us. I never as a child imagined that the priest came between me and the, and the Eucharist. It would be a very odd thing to think and feel. Yes, I will draw for also, uh, I agree with what uh, said uh, Brother Timothy, and I think it's very, very important how we look at the church. And it's about this new imagination. You have already, for instance, women president of a Catholic university, and many in the United States. It's a very, very important role. It's a woman who is the president of the International Federation of Catholic University. You have women as principal, as chancellors. We have at least two women chancellors of the diocese in the Synod Hall. Women as president of the Caritas. I can testimony in France, a few years ago, we had the first woman president of the Caritas Friend. She had a very strong voice in, uh, in front of the bishop talking to, to them and also uh, in the civil society. So I think it's very important to help all the, especially the, the young girls and, and young women, to highlight that the church is wide <laughs> with many different kind of church organizations and there are already many, many ways to give women, to foster women leadership. And I give a, uh, another example also for, from France. Now, a, a few years ago, one bishop started a new model of governance, having not only a vicar general, that has to be a priest, it's a canon law, but he appointed along the vicar general a woman as uh, general delegate. 
general delegate. That means the core governance is the bishop, the vicar general, and this woman. Now, 15 bishops have done that in France. It is spreading. And last, uh, a few days ago, because one of the bishops I know well was here with his priests and deacons, and he told me, uh, I have appointed a woman general delegate to work with me and my vicar general because as a bishop now in our situation in France, in this society, in this church, I can't imagine leading a diocese just as a bishop. So you have many examples like this that we need, and I hope the media could help also to highlight, uh, because there is still a lot that can be done. Non so se può aiutare un secondo. Certo. Eh, sono monaco, eh, leggendo i testi dei padri della Chiesa, gli apotecmi, trovate una raccolta importante di apotecmi di madri, del, non soltanto di padri del deserto, ma di madri del deserto, con una profondità teologica umana e tante volte anche psicologica notevolissima. Quindi forse evitiamo il sinonimo di... Eh, Uh, sottolineare il ruolo delle donne nella Chiesa con il clerica clericalizzarle. Ma la mia esperienza leggendo gli apotecmi dei padri e delle madri del deserto mi ha aiutato moltissimo. Grazie, grazie eccellenza. Eminenza deve aggiungere qualcosa? No? Prego. Penso che in realtà c'è molto di più di quanto pensiamo. Ma nella prassi proprio del pastorale, nelle curie, nel... Eh, nella, nella vita eh, so, l, eh, è molto molto più avanti di quanto noi stessi poi l'abbiamo registrato questa è un po' la mia impressione ecco. cioè non è appunto eh, sia nella storia ma nel, nel presente ecco. now the, the four replies were interesting you had father Radcliffe who talks about what we are trying to do is tr to transmit a teaching which is very true he, he gave a, a correct answer And then he moves on and he speaks about the doctors of the church, the women of the church, St. Teresa of Avila. Then we have Sister Natalie. She goes back into the power aspect. Well, look, there are women doing this, there are women doing that, the women doing this. Look, there's women here doing this and this and this. And so women have a place in the church. Um, I would classify that as more activism. Doing this, holding this position is not going to give you more, is not going to, allow you to know Christ more. Otherwise, you hold up a um, a goal in the church that not everyone, every woman w will be able to reach. Do you know what I mean? And uh, so I just be careful there with Sister Natalie's reply in the sense that it totally misses the mark. Totally, in my opinion. And she did ask for feedback. And Sister Natalie, I'm giving you the feedback. And um, there was a monk there. He gave a reply in, in, in Italian and he speaks about the, the desert mothers, the desert mothers. We also we always hear of the desert fathers, but there are there are many excellent women in the church that give perfect teaching on the goal of Christian life. And then at the end, we had Cardinal Zuppi and I didn't really understand his his reply. I mean, I, I understood his Italian. I didn't understand what he was trying to say. It didn't make sense to me. But I suppose I want to go back now to, to Father Radcliffe because, you know, as a Dominican, he, he made a true statement. He says, what we are trying to do is to transmit a teaching. What is the goal of that teaching? Where are we going with this teaching? You know, I'm glad he mentioned Sister or St. Teresa of Avila because I want to let you into a little secret of the Christian life. And this is revolutionary. It took me a lifetime to understand the secret of the Christian life, which is open to anyone. The secret of the Christian life is union with God. Like you, you, you might have heard it in a few videos. Not my idea, by the way. When we talk about teaching, the person that has taught me the most about the Christian life of, 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 of union with God is Jean Curie. Without a shadow of doubt. <laughs> there is no person that has taught us more. And in the midst of this crisis, he's trying to prepare us. Well, after this crisis is over in the church, what will we do? Where will we go in 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Who will we have formed? You know, we're all talking about the crisis and this. 
The solution to the crisis in the church is union with God, which is attainable for everybody. So if you're a, a housewife that's at home and you've no position, you've no doctorates and no nothing, you can have a higher status in the church than somebody, a woman who is president of a Catholic university. Just to give an example, because in the eyes of God, you know, we have to be looking, okay, well, what, what is, where, where do we sit in the eyes of God? Now, I had a very interesting experience when I went to Medjugorje. As I said, I went one day to Ostrog um, Monastery because I've been to so many monast Orthodox monasteries over the last 30 years. You know, uh, back 30 years ago, I went to an ecumenical meeting in, in, in Romania and made friends with many Orthodox and uh, bishops and so forth. So I, I've always um, tried to understand their point of view. Um, John Paul II, he wrote an encyclical called Ut Unum Sint, uh, that they may be one. And it impacted me, you know, when I read it at the time. So, you know, uh, as, as, as Catholics, you know, it's important that we, that we understand other churches if we're ever going to move to union. That aside, I find orthodoxy beautiful, you know, in many aspects of it. But one thing I find very beautiful about orthodoxy, and this is very important that people see. When I was driving back from Ostrog, back to Medjugorje, just before the border with, uh, with, with Bosnia, leaving Montenegro, I saw a sign for a monastery. I said, oh, look, there's a monastery there. I, I have time. Maybe I'll pass and see it. Anyway, I drive up to this monastery and I see a monk there with a levy and he's bringing bricks up to build a guest house in front of the monastery. Um... Uh, brother Spiridon, uh, he was the only monk there that I could see at the time. So I walk, I woke up to, I walked up to him and I said, "Look, brother, do you mind if I could see your church?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll go and get the key." Now he couldn't speak English. He, we were there with a bit with Google Translate and so forth. There was very little communication, verbal. But he he goes, he gets the keys, and he brings me into the mon to the the chapel in the monastery beautiful chapel beautiful chapel you won't find me posting very many videos of the 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 chapel and the relics in in Ostrog or of this monastery because they don't really like you to take videos it spoils the mystery of what you're encountering there if you want to experience it go to those places same with Mount Athos and although he didn't speak English and we couldn't communicate verbally, his actions spoke for themselves. So when we're in the monastery, you know, he opens up the relics for me to venerate. And there was a foot of St. Luke the Evangelist. This was like two days before uh, the feast of, of St. Luke the Evangelist. And so I venerated the, the relics. Uh, we spoke, you know, he asked me where I was from. I was from Ireland. What religion was I? I'm Catholic. As best as I could un understand, uh, I do speak Polish, uh, so I can understand many words in in, in Serbian and Slavic and in, in their language, Croatian. Uh, many of them are very very similar, but anyway, we could uh, uh, Sveti Luke Evangelista. I, I could understand as Sveti being holy, blessed saint, Luke the Evangelist. I could understand uh, what he was trying to tell me. After he after he had spent some time with me in his in his chapel, he brought me to his dining room and he said, "Look, uh, uh, I'll give you a drink." And this is typical of Orthodox monks. I've been to so many monasteries, and they're very much into uh, you know attending to pilgrims. You know, would you like a drink? They often offer, and this is on Mount Athos as well, they offer a, a shot of a liqueur or something like this. This is the typical thing when you go into an Orthodox monastery, they will offer you a shot of some of some liqueur, a glass of water, um, some type of sweet or, or something like that. In Mount Athos, they would, it's like a, a Turkish Delights type um, sweet made from honey. But the hospitality is a big thing. And then they sit with you. And if you're Orthodox and you can understand the language, they will do. They'll talk to you, talk to you about God. Or you want something like this. And, and in the midst of all of this, although we could not speak, although we could not speak, have a frank conversation, have an interesting conversation. 
I could see the action of Christ through this monk lost in, uh, you know, not lost, but hidden in that monastery. You know, this monk that gets up and builds his monastery and cleans it. You know, he's not a priest. He's just an ordinary monk. This, you could see the action of Christ in his life. Do you understand? You, you could see the theosis, the, the journey that he has done on theosis that lived out through him. You know, his asceticism and so forth. It's an observation because I've been to many Roman Catholic monasteries that wouldn't give you the time of day. You know, I remember going into one. And this is interesting. And I'm not here. I, I hate criticism. I hate criticizing. But it's just to give you an example. I remember walking into a Catholic community. Uh, they had a big church. And I said, do you mind if I visit your church? No, no, I don't have time. OK, and, and I'm, it's not there to criticize, but. It's just to, to reflect two experiences, two experiences where the monk set aside what he was doing. This monk set aside to show me his church, to give me something to drink, to sit down with me. You know, he was totally present where if I went into a, uh, a and I have, I have uh, to some Catholic communities if you're if you're visiting and no, I don't have time. Uh, I don't have time. Uh, and it's not to judge them. Maybe the person simply didn't have time. That's the reality. But if you're a pilgrim and say it's not Robert Newton, it's somebody that's coming back to the faith and they come to a community and they don't know much about the faith and that's their encounter with the faith is I don't have time. Uh, that, you know, the grace of God might have passed by. I suppose what I want to catch on here, and it's really, really, really important, is the nub of the question. And I'm sorry this video is going on too long. And if you've reached this time, you know, well done to you. But it's really important. It's the core of the Christian faith. You know, Father Radcliffe said, what we're trying to transmit is a teaching. You went 40% of the way. Teaching of what? To teach you what? About Christ? to teach you that he existed, to teach you what the church teaches, to teach you the catechism. Or I'll give you the great revelation that will transform the church, that the church will never be the same again when this teaching is understood in the church properly. The core of what we're trying to do, the church is try trying to do, is to teach you to have union with God. Now, that isn't something that Robert Nugent invented. You have David Torkington that is talking about it and you have Jean Curie. All of his teaching, all of his school, everything that he's writing is union with God. Union with God. He keeps bringing it up again and again and again. How do you have union with God? Making acts of faith, hope and love. You know, what is an act of love? To listen to the word of God. Lexio Divina. That's what he said to us, you know, an act of love is to do Lexio Divina. Because you listen to what Christ actually says. You know, it's an act of faith, an act of hope. All of these teachings that we need to practice and put into practice lead us to union with God. And St. Teresa of Avila talks about this. John of the Cross. John of the Cross, if you read his complete works lucky enough to speak Spanish and to be able to read them a bit very dense can seem very dense but both of them both of them talk about union with God it's interesting we're doing the school of prayer in Knock, and everything has been put up to stop this work for some reason it has been an interesting saga uh, and if uh, you know in in many ways uh Jean was coming over last month and at the airport forgot his passport and you know we had to we had to do it remotely and this month I'm coming back from Medjugorje and I have to collect him from the airport on Friday and I forget my car keys in Medjugorje and you know you wouldn't know what is going on but I suppose this message is so important completely absent from the synod completely absent from Irish synodal documents from the preparatory stage from the feedback from the faithful because they do not know they think that serving Christ for Catholics is serving because they're looking for Christ they're looking for God Catholics are looking for this and how and they want to get involved in the church 
And then, the, and then the priest says, well, look, become a Eucharistic minister, become a permanent deacon. How many people have said to me, become a permanent deacon? Is becoming a permanent deacon going to give me more union with God? No, it isn't. I can categorically tell you, it will not. Unless it's God's calling to me and he hasn't called me. <laughs> he hasn't. It would be a status. It would be power. And Sister Natalie, when she's giving her answers to the to the journalist, her answers are, look at this woman in power and this woman in power and this woman in power and this woman in power. She's in this place and this position. That's activism. That's a, a completely wrong answer. Yes, if you feel called to that, to serve in the church, fine. But it's not... It, if you're holding up, unless you have these types of roles, you're 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 not. Who are you in the church? Do you know what I mean? If you look at the life of Mother Teresa, she had union with God, and then she had the fruits. What did she do? You know, I I need to repropose that goal to you, priests and bishops, because I've known so many priests. This is not a judgment. This is an observation. Okay. So many priests who don't have union with God because they never speak of it. They write books after books after books and go on radio. But where is your, your, where is your talk of your experience with God? You know, who is Christ for you? What did he say to you? What is your path? You know, and again, it's just nothing I've said in this video is anything original from Robert Nugent. There is nothing here. Nothing. I have not come up with any original idea in my videos. Just so you're aware. So people are wondering where am I getting all this knowledge and teaching from. It is nothing to do with me. You know. But. It is the way. It is the way. I'm just telling you. You know, and that's why you need to make yourself a disciple of Christ, not a disciple of Robert Nugent. <laughs> you know, because we go and make ourselves disciples of, of these le of people that are great figures in the church. They fail you. I fail people. We, f we are failures. There is only one perfection that we need to look at. And that is Christ. And we're called to union with him. Union with God, theosis, deification, uh, you know, whatever you want to. Like, I really encourage Catholics, you know, to understand what Father, halfway Father Timothy brought you. What we're trying to trans transmit is a teaching. T teach us. Teach us union with God. Teach us the union with God. Don't confirm us in our sin. Oh, you're you're living in this state and you're living in this. And oh, yeah, well, someday you'll get there. You know, no hurry. Hold on a second. Christ is passing today. Give us Christ today. Teach us the apostolic faith of the church. The apostolic faith of the church was what? What was Christ trying to do? You read the writings of Maria Valtorta. I've spoken about them so many times. That's what Christ is trying to do in those writings. You cannot read them and not end up in a deeper union with our Lord Jesus Christ. And this isn't Robert Nugent giving you any bright idea, new fangled spirituality. It's the bread and butter of Catholicism. It's a mission of love. Christ loved. Everything he did was a complete act of love, self-giving. Offering himself, helping. Uh, and his mother, I mean, uh, where did he learn so much of this? He learned it from, you know, uh, well, he was God. He was love incarnate. I... I, I hope, I, sorry it went wrong, so wrong, but it is so critical. It is, there's no other uh, way in the church and if you're looking for if you're looking to think that being a priest or being a bishop or being the pope is going is going to give you a, a greater union with god it's 
In God's eyes, things look very different. In God's eyes, the most important people in the church could be the drug addicts, could be the people that are lost. Do you know what I mean? In God's eyes, the, uh, the, the souls that he is looking at could be very different to what we are looking at in the church. God is looking for those that are in pain, that are in loss, that don't know his love. And he wants to go there. He didn't come to call to form people that are already walking straight. He, call, he came for those that are walking off the path, that are walking crooked, that are lost, that are hurt. You know, the Good Samaritan. So, you know, the silly season in the Vatican and in the Synod will go on because they haven't spoken about this. They don't teach us this. You know, it's the great revelation in the church, the treasure. It's the treasure in the church. The, the, everything that we should be doing in the church has to point us towards the union with God. So you can be, as a woman, you can be a housewife. And have, and have the greatest level of sanctity of the church. Well, this is what matters. It's not what the world sees. It's what God sees. And I, as a man, I can have union with God without being a, a priest or a deacon or a bishop. Because most men in the church are not clerics. And yet you can have the fullness of the faith. The fullness of the realisation of the faith in your life. You can have it. It is open to everybody in the church. You do not need to have a position in the church to have union with God. You don't. So stop selling activism. It's a heresy. Oh, I need to be active to have union with God. No, you don't. I need to have this position. I need to be a Eucharistic minister. I need to do, uh, be part of this committee or go to that meeting. No, you don't. I'm sorry, you don't. None of that is necessary. You know, if you made one good confession and one good communion in your life, you probably do more than years spent of activism. And I lived it. I lived it. I lived activism. It's interesting. When I was a leader in Christ, I did ask once if I could read St. Teresa of Avila. Okay. OK, I did ask if I could read it and I was advised, no, don't read it, that this this um, it's too mystical. It's it's you know, it's it's too advanced. And the answer should have been, yeah, go ahead and read it. You mightn't understand it, but it will it will uh, it will grow in you the hope. Of where we're going. Um. And that's not my idea. That What I've just said to you is what Jan Curry told us. So just so you're clear. These mystics teach us. They teach us. They're, they're relevant. You know, she is a greater woman in the church than many of so-called activists that are presence of this and doing that and doing the other. And she's open and accessible to anybody. No, and unless you have a synod on theosis, it's just a discussion table. It's just that has been for the last couple of years has been dealing with the same topics, power and sex. A fight for power in the church. Unless I have power, I can't have Christ. It's crazy. It's crazy what we're selling the next generation. Unless you have a position, you can't have access to Christ. A priest is a barrier between you and Christ? No, it's never what the church taught. Do you understand? Our, our theology is sick. Our theology in the church is very, 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 is moribund. It's sick at this present moment in time. The answer is to prepare for after the crisis. And two people have said this to me, David Torkington and Jean Curry. Two different people are saying the same thing. Where, what will we do after the crisis? Where will we go after this crisis? Are we prepared after the crisis to give what to the church? 
you know. What Christ has left in his church, that he is there and he is an encounter. And that is theosis. I mean, the Orthodox monks, the Orthodox Church, if you read the Philokalia, uh, and if you read all of these treasures in the church, they're all pointing you to the same thing. We should be teaching people to enter into a personal discipleship with Christ. Unless you do this, nothing, 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 nothing you will do in the church will ever bear fruit. Nothing. Nothing. Unless that person has a personal, intimate relationship with Christ that, that, that strengthens them, that feeds them, nothing you will do in the church will work. You will make people activists that will burn out. They will get fed up. They won't understand. They won't. And, and we're teaching the next generation how to be active. To, to, you know, I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do... Hold on a second. Unless you go into the desert, unless you go into the desert and die to yourself and in order to understand Christ... You will never understand the, the the teaching of the church, the, you know. Anyway, very passionate topic. And again, nothing I've said to you is Robert Nugent's bright spark idea. Oh, revelation here. Nothing, nothing. This is what I've been taught. Because you either have to understand the faith, accept it, love it, or you have to, you know. It, and it was the great... <laughs> The great saints, the, especially Teresa of Avila, even before I met Jean Curie, she is the one that has really always captivated my mind. You know, an incredible woman. One of the one of the few saints that I, when I lived in Spain back in 1993, that's gosh, 30 years ago, 31 years ago. I remember walking to her grave in Alba de Tormes in Spain from Salamanca very beautiful walk anyway God bless you take care bye bye